Okay, uh, good morning. It's time to start with our lecture for today. So please turn off the computers and let's, let's get started. Any questions about what we have covered so far in the class? Uh, just in case you don't know, you have your first homework on tracks. So you, that homework is going to be due on Wednesday. So please make sure that you go over the homework. Uh, you have to submit the homework on Wednesday at the beginning of the lecture. I'll be in my office this afternoon from 3 to 5 in case, in case you have questions. Um, right now I'm giving you all the questions in the homework. Those questions are coming from, from the textbook. But later in the semester, I might not give you the, the questions. I'm just giving you time in case you haven't received your book. Um, if you don't have the book, and if you are not thinking on buying the book, I have uh, an extra copy in my office. You can borrow it to make copies. Uh, just let me know beforehand. Any, any questions? OK, so on. Um, Last thing we did last time was to go over the material on flow systems. And these were the objectives of that lecture. Today we're going to complete this uh, lecture on flow and activity relationships. And I just want to give you some uh, a review of what we discussed so we can continue. So the idea of this lecture is to for you to understand the, the interactions between flow systems uh, flow activity relationships that we are going to discuss today and space requirements and how they relate to facilities planning. So this is uh, the material we cover on flow systems. Uh, the important thing here is that the flow process can be described in, in this, based on these three entities, a subject of flow, a resources, and the communication that uh, occur between the resources. So those are the three things. And we also discuss uh, the flow system in, in three categories. Uh, materials management systems, the material flow system, and the physical distribution system. And we highlighted that we were going to focus on the second one. the material flow system. So we discussed each one of them and then we went back to material flow system and in terms of the material flow system we'll focus on uh, with an emphasis on flow patterns and structures from three perspectives uh, within workstations, within departments, and between departments. And we also mentioned that for the first part, which is the workstations, there's a course already offered in, in the School of Engineering, which is IE3360. And we are not going to go in detail in, in the design of the workstations, because that is material that is covered on that course. But we talk about the flow within departments uh, within the process department, between departments. And we also discussed that the effective flow planning for this type of uh, flow is a hierarchical planning process. And most of the time, these are the three objective functions. Um, usually decide which one of them are we going to use when we are trying to maximize or we are trying to optimize the flow within a department. So you can maximize the direct flow path, you can minimize the total flow, or you can minimize the total cost of the flow. So those are the three options. And we're going to discuss uh, models that target those uh, objective functions later in the semester. But usually those are the three main things that uh, are used to measure the performance of your design. And then we talk about department planning and how that relates to uh, material flow. So planning departments can be can involve production support, 
and administrative and service areas. And we are planning for a new area. You have to take into account all those things and also um, service areas can include restrooms and so on. So uh, a production planning department is a collection of workstations that are grouped together in a facility layout uh, process. And depending on the product volume, there are different type of layout that you can use. And we also talk about how the layout will change when the volume and the variety that you have in your product change. Skip this. And this was the last thing we discussed. Um, here we are mentioning um, how to, or the importance of sales within the manufacturing department. Um, so when you have a product family department, a PDF, a PFD, aggregate medium volume variety parts into families based on similar manufacturing operations or design attributes. So you have a product family, meaning that you have different products, but they are very similar, such as the ones that I'm showing here in this picture. Um, so for that type of product, you can, the machines required to manufacture the part family can be grouped together to form a cell. And that was uh, basically created this term called cellular manufacturing. And there are several ways that you can, or several methodologies that you can use to form these cells within a department. One of these methodologies is called the direct clustering algorithm, which is a very simple algorithm that we're going to learn here to allow you to organize your products in order to form a cell. Um, so it's a methodology, it's a simple procedure that clearly illustrates the important features of cell clustering, of the cell clustering problem. And this direct clustering algorithm is based on a machine part matrix in which one indicates the part requires processing uh, by the indicated machine. So if you, have, if you see a one in this matrix, that means that that part has to go through that machine. If, if you don't see a number one, then that means that that part will not require that machine for processing. And on the next slide, we have an example. Oh, well, first we need to discuss what's, uh, what are the steps of the algorithm. Um, so again, this is a very simple algorithm, simple steps. Um, first thing that you're going to do, you're going to start with something like this. You're going to start with a matrix. You're going to have rows, um, meaning that these are six different part types. And then you have each column represent a different machine. And then you're going to have uh, a one, meaning that part one requires machine number one to be processed but part number one does not require machine number two, and so on. So you start with something like this, and then in order to find the best clustering for the cells, you're gonna follow these steps. So the first thing you're gonna do is to order the ro rows and columns, um, sum the number ones in each column and in each row of the machine part matrix, and then you're gonna order the ro rows first, from top to bottom in descending order of the number ones in the rows and order the columns left to right in ascending order of the number of ones in each row, in each column. Where ties exist, then you're gonna break the ties by the descending uh, numerical number that you have assigned to your uh, machine or part. Then after you do that first part, so you're going to add all the columns, all the rows, and you're going to put them in uh, descending order, ascending order for the rows, descending order for the column. Then you go to step number two. You're going to sort the columns beginning with the first row of the matrix, shift to left of the matrix of column having a one in the first row. Then continue the process row by row until no further opportunity exists for shifting columns. Then you're going to do the same thing for each one of the rows. So first you shift the columns to the left. Now you go to step number three. You're going to sort the rows, column by column, beginning with the left most column. 
and you're going to tip the rows upward when the opportunity exists to form blocks of ones. Performing the column and rows are sortation can be done in Excel, but we're going to do it here for uh, small examples. So we can do it by hand. And once you have done those sortings in your matrix, then you can start forming cells. Look for opportunities to form cells such uh, that all processing for each part occurs in a single cell. Okay, so seeing an algorithm and how it works, difficult just by reading it. So that's why I'm showing an example on the next slide. So we start with this matrix. As I mentioned, we have five machines and we have six different parts. Um, each one represents the parts that needs to be processed by, uh, by each machine. Um, so if we apply the first step of the direct clustering algorithms, the rows are ranked in descending order of the number ones. So we're going to look at the rows. And basically what we are doing is one, two, and three, we are adding those numbers. So one, two, two, one, two, two, one, two, one, and one. And then we are rank, the rows are ranked in descending order of the number one. So that's why you see row number three is now the first row because that one has three ones. Row number six has two, four has two, and one has two. So in that case, we have a tie between these three part types. So we break the tie by the highest number for the part. So six, four, and one, and then five and two. So that's the first step. We sort them in ascending order, descending order, I'm sorry. And then again, ties are broken in descending numerical sequence. The row order sequence, the part number is, I'm going to have 3, 6, 4, 1, 5, 2. Um, so now we move to the columns. The columns are arranged in ascending order of the number of ones, which ties broken in descending the numerical order. So we're going to add again. Let me change this number, uh, this color. So one and two, one, two. One, two, one, two, one, two, and three. So the rows rank in descending order. So you go from the highest number to the lowest number. And for the columns, you go from the lowest number to the highest number. And now you start seeing how you have some type of grouping for me. You have a group of ones here. You can say that you have another group around here. But there's uh, additional steps that we need to follow. So the resulting column order sequence is 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Any questions? Okay, so uh, again, this very simple algorithm, but you need to be careful. Start moving those rows and columns and you don't miss any ones or you forget to move the whole column or the row. So just be careful. Um, step number two involves sorting the columns to move toward the left, all columns having a one in the first row which represents part three. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go row by row and we're going to start moving. Is there any other one on the first? Maybe that will be easier to see if we go back here. 
So we're going to look at the first row, and we're going to find if there's any ones on that first row that can be moved to the left. In that case, this column has a one. You can move that one to the left. And that's what we did here. We move that two to this position. And we move the whole column. Okay? Now we look, is there any other ones here? No. Then we move to the, to the next row. So we're going to find if there are any ones here. In that case, all the ones are towards the left, so you don't have to do anything. And we follow the same process until you get to the last row. In that sense, we have now this new order. We have a group of ones here and another group here. There's one more step to follow. Now we need to look at the um, step number three. So um, we are going to sort the, col uh, the rows by moving upward rows, having a one in the first column that are not already located as far toward the top of the matrix. So now instead of going row by row, we're going to go column by column. And if we find a one in this column that we can move up, you're going to move it. So if we go back here, on the first one, we have no other uh, one. On the second one, we have no other one. But on the third one, we have this one. So that's the one that we're going to move here. And then we move to the next row. Those are already on at the top as they can go. Okay, so first we move all the ones to the left, then we move all the ones to the top. And as you can see now, we have a better grouping of those assignments. So that was step number three. And we move to step four, and now we can form cells. So based on those assignments, um, parts three, five, and six uh, being processed in a cell made up machines two, four, and six, uh, five, I'm sorry, and with parts one, two, and four being processed in a cell consisting of machine one and three. So this is our second cell. Machines three and one, first cell, which is five, four, and two. Any questions? Okay, so um, you might have uh, on your next homework a problem related to this, so you make sure that you understand. Um, process again it's very simple but you have to practice uh, a couple of times to just get uh, the feeling of how the algorithm works so any any questions so uh, on on the next slide we have a different example it's following the same algorithm but now we have a different uh, matrix uh, we have again six parts in five machines, and we're going to use the algorithm to determine our alternative groupings of machines. So after applying the algorithm, this is the solution we get. Okay? So we, I'm assuming that we already went through the process of moving columns and rows, and this is our solution. Okay, so we find the solution, and we are now trying to form those cells. But what happened? There's a there's a group of parts that is not allowing you to create a cell or seeing a right cell right away. So if we look at um, notice that because machine two is needed for part three and five, a conflict exists. So you can start forming two cells. But if you form a cell like this, then you have this one that stays by itself. So there's a conflict there. And if you move on the opposite direction, you form machines two, four, and five 
a cell, in between one and three, another cell, then you're going to leave this one uh, alone. So there's multiple things that we can do to, to address such type of problem. Um, I'm going to give you two types of solutions. Uh, the first one is, is if machines two and three can be located uh, close to one another in different cells. Then part five could be process, processed by machine on the boundaries of the, of the cells. So that's basically saying that you will form two cells and then you will place a machine on the boundaries of that of those cells. Another solution, and if you have enough money and space, is to dupl duplicate machine two and place it in each cell. So you're going to have two of the same type of machine, and then you're going to du duplicate that machine. So we can see that using the matrix, so instead of having two by itself, now we have two A and two B, and we're going to have the same machine, or same type of machine, but one located in each cell. Um, so if you duplicate, then you can form two type of cells, one like this, and one like this. Any questions? Okay. So that's one way, one methodology for you that will allow you to form uh, cells in a cell manufacturing environment within your department. And again, try to visualize what we're trying to do at this point of the semester in this class. Um, try to explain to you what are the goals. So we, are, we can see facilities planning from multiple perspectives, from um, logistics perspective that you're going to place a, a new facility in certain states of the of the nation. You can see from uh, designing the department itself of the facility, de designing what is inside the facility, or you can see it from designing the workstation of your employee. What we're going to focus in this class is in the design within the department, inside the, the facility. And I'm trying to uh, show you several tools that you can use. For instance, if you have uh, an assignment, you have a product family in your facility, and you have to come up with a design for a cell manufacturing environment. So this is one of the tools that you have. And we're going to keep adding to this uh, toolkit, and I will try to uh, put in perspective what we are trying to do every time we, we cover one of those tools. Any any questions? Okay. So um, I think this is the last topic in this first part of the lecture. So these are layout types based on material flow system. So the type of material flow system is determined by the make up of the activities or planning departments amount uh, which materials flow. And as we discussed previously, there's four types of production planning departments. The first one is called the production line departments. Second one is fixed materials location departments. The third one is product family department.
Okay, so that's the type of, of layout that we um, address with the cell manufacturing and the design using cells. And then process department. And then we have just uh, some representations using these uh, flow diagrams I'm trying to show you the differences between each type of uh, material flow system. So on this first one, we have the production line product layout, which is, uh, I think, kind of simple to see. We're going to have multiple lines, and each line will be producing a different product. So this line we produce, let's say, Tylenol is uh, Tylenol PM, another type of medicine, and so on. Um, again, this is not the best example. We have different type of machines, but you, you get the, the idea. So it's different type of products being processed, each one on a different product line. And we have some advantages and uh, limitations for uh, the product layout. Um, some of them include smooth, simple, logical, direct flow. So you don't get confused, you know that this line is producing this, this line is producing this, and so on. Um, the total production time per unit is short. Um, material handling requirements are reduced, and there's less skill required for the personal. Some of the limitations, uh, this is something that you will see a lot if you have like, this type of layout. If one of the, of the machines breaks, then you are not going to be able to produce that type of product because your production is limited for that type of product to that uh, machine line or that production line. So that's one limitation. So you, you cannot move the production of this item to this line because you have a different type of process uh, here. Um, <coughs> the product design changes cause the layout to become obsolete. Um, slowest station pace the line and general supervision is required. So this is for production line departments. Then we have the fixed product layout. In this one, you have, most of the time you have large items, like large products, say a big engine or an airplane, something like that. So you have to bring everything to the location of that item. So that's what this is representing. Um, material movement is reduced. Some of the advantages um, provi provide the provision opportunities. Uh, highly flexible, can accommodate changes in product design, product mix, and production time. And some of the limitations may result in duplicate equipment, requires greater skill for personnel, and requires general supervision. The next one, this is the product family layout, which is again uh, related to the cell manufacturing. So from the diagram, you can see that there's a group of machines like this, this, and this one. Those are your cells. Um, so some of the advantages for this one is that by grouping products, high machine utilization can result. So you can use those cells, and those are very flexible, so you can uh, change the type of product that you're using or producing on your production facility. Um, smoother flow lines and shorter travel distances are expected um, for that process layout. It encourages consideration of general purpose equipment. And for most of them, you're going to require, all of them, you're going to require supervision. Um, for this type of cell manufacturing, greater labor skills required for team members. 
Most of the time you have the same person moving the product from one station to the other, so you will have different skills uh, required for each one of the workstations in that sales, and so on. And then finally, we have the, the process layout. Um, so in here you have uh, an increased machine utilization. Uh, general purpose equipment can be used, highly flexible on allocated personnel and equipment, uh, diversity tasks for personnel, and, and so on. And I think that's um, the important thing with for this is that you are able to differentiate between them. And that covers the first part of the of this lecture. So we went through these first four topics, flow system, material flow system, department planning, and layout type based on material flow. Now we're gonna move to uh, activity relationships. And <coughs> space requirements. So that's the second group of slides for this lecture. And I can tell you we're going to have a quiz today. It's not a quiz. It's a lab that you're going to be working in groups for um, don't get scared. Yeah, you will, you will work in group and it's going to be something easy to work I just want you to, to practice one of the things that we're going to cover in this part of the lecture. Um, so now <clears throat> we get into uh, activity relationships. So most of the time when you are planning, let's say you have an empty building and you want to build a new facility, as I was telling, for Tesla, you need to come up with the departments that you're going to need and how those departments are going to be located with your, within your facility. Most of the time what we do to, to find out where to place each department is to find out what are the um, material movement that will occur between those two departments, how, how much flow is going to be happening, because if you're going to have a department that depends on the other, you don't want to place them apart in the same facility. You want to put them as close as possible. So that's the type of thing that we can find out using these tools. We want to find out what are those departments that depend on each other so we can find the best location with this facility. So we're going to discuss that uh, with this activity uh, relationship uh, diagrams. So again, we going to skip this. Uh, these are the objectives for the class. So I might mention them on the next lecture. But these are the two topics that we have to cover in order to complete the, first, uh, the second lecture. So activity relationship and space requirements. And again, we want to see how that relates to facilities planning. So again, uh, activity relationships. We want to we want to find out what are the activities and how <laughs> these departments relate to each other, so we can find the best location for them in our facility. So what we are trying to do is measuring the activities. among departments is one of the most important elements in the lay layout of departments. So as I was, men was mentioning, uh, there will be some departments that have more flow of product, of information, or any other type of thing, equipment. So we want to put those uh, departments as close as possible. So for instance, we have six, nine departments here we can identify the flow with those departments with those arrows, green arrows, green, uh, red, and so on. So for example, if you have a lot of flow from office to this department over here, that will 
push this uh, department to be close to that. But as you can see, there's not a lot of flow between these two departments, so they can be placed away from each other. And that's the type of thing that we, we want to be able to identify. So <clears throat> to evaluate alternative arrangements, uh, activity relationships must be established. So activities relationships must be established. Um, this can be specified in a quantitative or qualitative qualitative manner. So do you guys know what's the difference between these two? Yes, which one? Correct. The number the quantitative is a uh, number based. The other one is based on characteristics. Uh, something that you cannot uh, quantify. Or you I want to try to quantify, but there's no specific way of quantifying. So we're going to discuss those two areas. Um, so, uh, for instance, uh, a chart that can be useful in the flow measurement is the mileage chart. So this is a quantitative uh, approach. So in this case, we're looking at the flow between two or two different cities. So we have a from and to city, and we can quantify what's the distance between those two cities. So if you go from Boston to Atlanta, you have this amount. Same thing if you go from backward, you have the same distance. Um, pretty sure you have seen this before, but this is called a uh, mile chart. And this area of the table will be replicated if the distance going from or from one one city to the other and back is the same. So this is what we are seeing here. And this diagonal is empty because that's the distance between the city that you are and the same city. So that's why you don't have any information there. So we can use this type of chart to and, and use it for uh, facilities planning. And I think we have uh, an example later, so I will show it to you later. Um, another type of representation is when distances between two cities are symmetric, the mileage can be represented in a triangular mileage chart. And this is how it works. You have this triangular shape. You have your cities. And then you start putting those distances in this area. So this block right here is for the distance between these two cities. But this block is for this one to this one. Um, let me see another one. This right here is the distance between New York and Boston. So you start adding these blocks in this way. So you can uh, represent this using this type of shape. So I just want, don't want you to get confused. So if you follow those lines, you'll find the right distance between the cities. So one more time. So you go up here and down here, you'll find the distance between New York and Boston. Any questions? 
we're going to use this representation also later. So let's look at the quantitative flow measurements. So again, this flow may be measured quantitatively in terms of the amount move between departments. And the chart that is uh, most often used to record this type of flow is called a from to chart. So what we have here is an example. Now we have different departments of the of the facility. So we have stores, milling, turning, press, fleet, assembly, and warehouse. And we have the same departments here. We put them on the column, first column, first row. And now we're going to measure the amount that is pulled between these departments. Um, so, for instance, you are moving from stores to mining twelve units. You move from stores to press nine units. Um, if you are going from assembly to store, you are moving one unit. Okay, so this is the same type of representation, just like the one we have for the mileage. Now, this is called from to chart. Same idea, but this is including the departments within the facility. Again, we have this, this, and we're going to measure the amount of units that are moved between departments. Any questions? So the steps for constructing this type of chart, you're going to list all the all departments down the road and across the column following the overall flow pattern. Establish a measure of flow for the facility that accurately indicates equivalent flow volumes. So let's say that you have different type of units. Uh, one weights 10 pounds, another weights 20 pounds. You need to find out a unit that will fit both. So maybe you can come up with, uh, choose one of them and then represent this unit that weighs 10 pounds, you say the, the units that go from the department is two times the weight of this one. So you can represent uh, equivalent flow volumes. Uh, if the items move are equivalent with respect to EC of movement, the number of trips might be recorded in the front two chart. Uh, if they vary size, weight, value, shape, and so on, then some common unit of measure may be established so that the quantifies recorded in the front two chart represent the proper relationship. So again, having an equivalent type of unit is important. Based on the flow paths for the items to be moved and the established measure of flow, record the flow volumes in the flow two chart. Okay, so these are the steps that you need to follow to construct this type of uh, chart. So let's look at this example. So here we have a firm that produces three components. Component one and two have the same size and weight. and are equivalent with respect to movement. Um, component three is almost twice as large and moving two units of either component one or two is equivalent to moving one unit of component number three. So again, we are trying to find an equivalent type of measurement that we can use to quantify the flow. So a move it, movement factor of two is assigned to component three. Uh, departments included in the facility are A, B, C, D, and E. So we have five departments. And for this illustration, we assume that the departments are arranged in a linear flow pattern in the order of A, C, B, D, and E. Uh, the quantifies to be produced are and the component routings are 
uh, routings are, are followed. So we have this table, or this one of the components, we have the production quantities per day, we have the movement factor, um, the equivalent flow per day. So a unit of one or two equi is equivalent to two units of this unit. Um, so when you multiply the movement factor, this two will stay the same, but you have to multiply these times two, so we can find an equivalent measurement. And then we have the routing for the station. So component number one will go through station A, then go to C, B, D, and E. And same follows for component number two will go to A, then B, D, and E. And finally, three will go to A, C, D, B, and E. So what we are going to do now is to, using this information, we're going to quantify the movement between stations using this table. So we're going to start with component one. So component one move from A to C. So we're gonna have one here. And we're gonna move 30 units of that one. So that's 30. Then we go from C to B. So C is here, B is here, so we have 1, and we move 30 units. Then we follow with B moving to D, we have 1, 30 units, and finally D to E, we have one thirty units. Okay, so that's the flow happening with the first component. And we move to the second component. We have go from A to B to twelve. Any, any questions so far? Okay, so we go to B to D. So from B to D, we have two 12 units. And then we have D to E, we have two 12. So we are done with one and two. Now we go to the third one. We have from A to C, A to C we have 3, 14, then we have C to D, that's 14, then D to B, 14. And then B to E, forty. So the only thing that's missing now is that we have to add this amount for each one of the uh, stations. So let me change this color. So for the first one, we have 44, we have 12, we have 30, 14, 42, 14, 14, and 42.
then for this one zero 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 Okay, so we have the movement from A to C is 44, from A to B is 12, from A to D is 0, A to E is 0, uh, C to B is 30, and so on. And that's how you create your from 2 graph. Any questions? Okay, now, so I'm going to give you the quiz now. Quiz is going to, it's not a quiz, it's a lab. So you're going to work on group of three. And you're going to create a from two chart for these problems. So, this, maybe you Yeah. Uh -huh. 